pardon me. I, uh, when I swallowed my water, I swallowed it down the, the wrong tube, you might say. <clears throat> Why don't we go ahead and open up with the word of prayer? We're going to get right into the message this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that you've left behind for us, for the awesome covenant you've given to us, for your blood, for your spirit. We thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I just ask something from you this evening that you would magnify yourself, that you would glorify yourself, that you would speak to those who are listening and to those who will hear. Father, I want to decrease. I want you to increase. I want to decrease. But I want it to be your words that go forth. Your truth. And that it would change people's hearts. That it would turn their hearts from darkness to light. That it would turn their hearts from the world, the flesh, self, the devil. Lord, unto you. Jesus, I ask you for this. And I ask you to bring back to my remembrance for your glory for the sake of the souls listening, all those things that you've shown me and told me, Jesus. And I thank you now, Father. Amen. Uh, listen, I, we're going to continue uh, to do what Jesus came to do. This is part six. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell you first that I really can't put into words what's in my soul tonight it's just a sense of knowing a sense of understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord it's just a sense of awe a sense of majestic wonder as I press in and the Lord draws me closer to him as I come to see him more and more something happens in my soul something will happen in all of us when we come to see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, when we come to see Jesus Christ as Simon Peter did, when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, when we see Jesus, things will change. Our lives will change. Just like that woman that's the, the woman at the well, the, the Samaritan woman. She said to Jesus, she said, <clears throat> I know that when the Christ comes, the Messiah, when he comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, after he gave her a dose of the living water, I who speak to you am he. The woman left her water pot. She left her water pot and ran back into the city because she found out who Jesus Christ was. She found out he was... She found that that man she was looking at was Jesus Christ, and her whole life changed. Brothers we and sisters, we've got to see Jesus Christ. We've got to see him in this place. Our freedom will come. In this place, our purpose, our, our reason for being in existence will come to light. We'll see him who is our life. When we come to see him as our portion and our inheritance, our reason the air we breathe, the meat we, we eat, the water we drink, the treasure that we seek, it's Jesus. And so I stand before you tonight. I feel like as much as possible at this moment for me, with the capacity that I have, I feel like I'm standing before you tonight in a state of knowing who Jesus Christ is right now. And I just pray that the same thing will happen more and more as I get to know him more and as you get to know him more. Because this is where lives will change. God will use us while in this place to change lives. He will manifest himself. Is not the Holy Spirit's job to glorify Jesus? The Holy Spirit, when he comes upon us, he said, I, he will glorify me, is what Jesus said. He will glorify me. 
you will glorify Jesus. So look, this is what we want to do is glorify Jesus. We want to glorify Jesus, what he said, what he did, what he does, for it's in the knowledge of no other but Jesus. It's in eating no other bread but the bread of life and drinking no other water but the living water from the day spring from on high do we come into our purpose, into our place, into oneness with the God who made us. So this is what Jesus came to do, part six. And this is the number tenth thing that Jesus Christ came to do. And it's found in Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 7. Jesus said this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Jesus came to show mercy. He came to show the mercy of the Father. He came to help, heal, and deliver, to save, not to destroy. Although at the end of the age, he will destroy all wickedness. He'll put an end to all the madness, all the rebellion. He'll crush the insurrection. But Jesus said, I did not come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. You see, he came to call those who want to be free from sin. He came to draw the blind, the poor, the wretched, the miserable, the naked, the deaf, the heart of heart, the shame, the ones who are shamed, who are filled with shame, the poor, the broken, the wretched, the lowly, the foolish, the weak things of the world. The wonderful thing is, is that we're all of those things, but not all of us will come to that realization before it's too late. So look, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain Mercy. Now let's, let's talk for a little minute about the mercy of God. Let's talk about when Jesus says they'll obtain mercy. Let's talk about what the mercy of God is and what it is not. It's very important to understand this. Remember Jesus said to the, to the scribes and Pharisees, He said, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Well, if they would have gone and learned what that meant, they would have come to realize that what God was saying in that passage of Scripture was this. Oh, you want to very superficially come and present your gifts to me on the altar? You want to offer your sacrificed animals? You want to come to me and sing your songs? You want to offer up a sacrifice? But it's really not from your heart. You're only doing it because you think that you can appease me with your superficial rituals, but God was saying this, I desire mercy. In other words, I desire for you to be merciful to people. I desire instead, what really pleases me is that you would walk in my nature, that you would walk in my character, that you would be like me. See, the scribes and Pharisees were legalistic. They were self-righteous. They had no mercy or no compassion. They were of their father, the devil, as the Lord Jesus told them in John chapter 8, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. And so Jesus said, go and learn what this means. He told them, he told them to cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside may be clean also. So Jesus is saying, blessed are those who show mercy for they shall obtain mercy. Jesus came to show mercy, compassion on man, yet not just any man, not just any person. Yes, God is very merciful to the world. He's constantly holding back and restraining His judgment, His wrath. It is being stored up. There is a day of wrath coming. So God is merciful in that way. But Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are those who have come to realize how wretched they are, how wretched 
they are. And then they become meek and humble and merciful, full of mercy, full of, full of compassion. You see, that's how God is. God remembers that we are just dust of the earth. He remembers what we are, and He gives us mercy as long as we're found beating our chest like that tax collector at the temple that day. The Pharisee said, Oh, thank God I'm not like this wretched tax collector. I tie this and I tie that, and I do this and I do that. I'm not like him. But who went away justified, the Lord told us? Not the Pharisee. The tax collector on his knees begging God for mercy, saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's who will walk away justified. No doubt that tax collector was merciful to others as well because he knew what he was without the living God. So, the mercy of Jesus Christ is, is not of the nature that will comfort us and pamper us and forgive us, and pardon us, and overlook us while we are walking on the broad and wide path which leads to destruction, forsaking Him, forsaking His ways, doing our own thing. We think that we can walk this path and expect God to just be so ever merciful and protect us from the... <clears throat> Penalties of wrong choices. Protect us from uh, the reaping and sowing process. You see, there is an e eternal machine in the spirit realm. Ever functioning, always busy. The gears of this machine are always going. What is that machine? It is the reaping and sowing process. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Though God is merciful... And He won't allow us to reap the fullness of what we deserve, thankfully. But you see, Jesus came to show mercy to the one, really, who stops walking this way and walks the narrow path. Who's willing to take up their cross daily and deny themselves and follow Jesus. His mercy is resting upon these though he does have mercy on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. But let me ask you, what good is that general mercy going to do you at the end of the age if you continue to walk that path? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all be in vain. It'll all be vanity. That God had his mercy on you, his general kind of mercy, your whole entire life, and you never saw what God was holding back and restraining until the day that Jesus Christ came in the clouds with great glory and power with the holy angels of heaven and every knee bowed and every tongue confessed whether they liked it or not that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nay, God's mercy won't do a thing for us on that day if we're not right in Him on that day. Let's talk a little more about the mercy of God. Is the mercy of God of the nature that <clears throat> He will turn His back while we live wickedly and then at the end of the age say, well, because you prayed a prayer back in 1971 on your knees at a Baptist revival over the summer, I'll let you in. Because you had good intentions. You had good intentions. Oh, you had good intentions. Willie? No. God's mercy is reserved for those who fear Him. For those who know that they can't do nothing without Him. God proves His mercy. Here's how, one way. Okay? Imagine this. Imagine that I am <clears throat> the gatekeeper at a... Um, at a great restaurant. And, and you can't come in unless the gatekeeper opens the door. Unless I open the door, you're not coming in. And there's certain requirements you have to meet before you come in. Okay? Let's just for the sake of this analogy say it is impossible 
impossible for any person on the earth to meet these requirements. Impossible! So the doorkeeper, in his great mercy, says, man, I really want these people to come in. But they can't. They don't have what it takes. They don't have what, they don't have what I'm looking for. They don't have what they need to get in here. God, what am I going to do to get them in here? Because I can't break my laws, man. I can't lower my standards. What can I do to get these people in here? Okay, I got it. I'm going to make a way for them to acquire and to possess that which is needed to come in to my place. And so God gives us his grace. God gives us his his nature, his character, his life force, his DNA, his power, his ability to do that which was impossible that we can come in. You see, he circumcises our heart with the circumcision of Christ, a circumcision made without hands. As he told Moses in the old covenant, he said this, he said, I will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God. What's that mean? I will circumcise your fleshly heart, your carnal heart, so that you can love me, so that you can live. Brothers and sisters, what an awesome gift. God does something in us and enables us to live and do and function and think the way we never could so that we can love him, so that we can live, that's mercy. Man, that is mercy. Did you, you, you understand what I'm saying? That's how merciful and good God is. We're not talking about that fake mercy, that fake agape, that fake greasy grace. No, God would really do... He, he really does what I just said. That's what He does. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. <clears throat> mercy triumphs over judgment as, as it is written in James. <clears throat> so the number 10 thing that Jesus came to do <clears throat> was to show mercy to the merciful. <clears throat> the number 11th thing that Jesus Christ came to do is Matthew 5 8. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Jesus came to reveal and unfold and manifest the nature and character and heart, mind and will of God. Yet he only will unveil his truth and glory to the ones who want him and seek him. That is, to those who respond to the Father, drawing them. Because Jesus said, no one can come to me unless my Father draws them. People say, I found God. I found Jesus. No, He found you. He drew you. He drew me. You see, <clears throat> no man seeks after God is what is written in the book. No one seeks after God. No man stirs himself up to seek after God is what is written through the prophet Isaiah. So what? You mean <clears throat> that never-ending quest for truth that I was on? That wasn't of my own effectual working? That was God working in me, drawing me to Him. It was God calling from a distance, Mark, Mark, this way. He's the one that put the hook in my mouth and drew me to Him. He's the one that fished me out of the pond of death. He's the one that made me take the bait. We can take no credit for anything. It's all glory to God. 
It's all glory to Jesus Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What, cont- what in here, what, what did I just read, what is it that Jesus, in this statement, what, what shows us what he came to do? <coughs> he came, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus Christ came to reveal God to humanity. Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father. Is it not written? He is the express image of his person. Did he not say to Philip, "Mm, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Did he not say to Philip, how can you say to me, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? It is written in John chapter 1. I'll turn there. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. Now, I know that <clears throat> Isaiah saw him high and lifted up, right? Ezekiel saw him sitting on his throne, the wheel within the wheel. I know, right? Moses hid in the cleft of the rock and saw the Lord, right? What is he talking about then? No one has seen God at any time. And in another place, Jesus said, <clears throat> not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. What is he talking about? God. You've got to look up that word. You've got to do a little research for this to make a little bit more sense. No, no man can see God and live. But yet these men saw God in a vision. God, they had a visitation, right? God, that word God, is a very specific word in the Hebrew. God is Elohim. <clears throat> It's a plural word. It it expresses more than one, three to be exact, plural. Remember when in the beginning it said, let us make man in our image? Look, man is now like us, knowing good and evil. No one has seen the fullness of the Godhead bodily. No one has seen the Elohim. No one has seen that mysterious manifestation, that mysterious reality of the fullness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No one has seen God at any time, okay? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And that word declared in the Greek literally means revealed or unfolded, like a gift, like a present. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit revealed, unfolded, unveiled before them. They shall see him through the eyes of faith. Jesus said in John chapter 6, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have everlasting life. And in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says this, The eyes of the Lord run run to and fro over the face of the whole earth, looking, looking for someone whose heart is perfect or loyal towards him, that he might show himself strong on their behalf. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And again, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14. <clears throat> We're admonished here to do something. In verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. <clears throat> without Mark Moore getting holy, without my wife getting holy, without you getting holy or you getting holy, 
no one will see the Lord. What, is that, what do you mean by that? God wants to reveal himself through you. God wants to prove himself through you and I. And without a holy heart, a pure heart, a loyal heart, the world around us will not see him through us. And at the end of the age, we're not going to get to spend eternity with him. Jesus said, blessed, happy, happy to be envied are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 is a wonderful declaration, a wonderful reality to behold. Second Corinthians 3, verse 18 says this, <coughs> pardon me, but we all with unveiled face Beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's like this. <clears throat> when we see Jesus, when we, when we behold him in the mirror of the word, because that's what it's like. It's supposed to be a, a transforming mirror to whatever we see in it. We look at it. We're supposed to be transformed into what we're seeing. As it says in James, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So look, this is a mirror. Beholding, as in a mirror, the, the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image that we see in there. We're going to see the nature and the character and the image of Jesus Christ. And when we see Him, through the Word, by the quickening of the Holy Spirit, we'll be changed into His likeness and image. It's true. The Word says it. And I know it's true in my own life. Well, it's written, when we see Him, we'll be like Him. What kind of amazing, miraculous, like... Uh, Spiritual photosynthesis occurs in that process. A conversion occurs. Conversion. You go from this into that. You get transliterated from darkness, sin and death, into light and righteousness and life when you behold Jesus Christ. The emphasis is this. We have got to see Jesus. Do you, I mean, do you realize, man, everything the devil is wanting to do is stop you from seeing Jesus Christ. It says in the first epistle of Peter, he says this, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Imagine this were a shelf right here. Peter's saying, take your hope. Your hope of what? Your hope of salvation. Your hope of oneness with God. Your hope of victory. Your hope of everything that God has told you is true. You take your hope, as Peter said, and you rest it. Take your hope and rest it fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you. Hold on. Rest your hope fully upon the divine enabling power, the ability, the transfer of God's DNA into you, the ability to do God's will, God's strength, God's nature, God's character, God's virtue. Rest your hope fully upon all that that will be brought to you, that will be given to you, that will come to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when you see Jesus for who He is, when you can say, oh, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and He thus says to you, 
Blessed are you, Mark Moore. Blessed are you, Natalia Moore. Blessed are you, Krista. Blessed are you, Mom. <laughs> Blessed are you, Emmett and Naomi. Blessed are you, whoever is watching, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What happens at that moment? You have something that you didn't have before. You have ability. You have divine strength, divine enablement, divine empowerment to do what? Not just what you want to do, what God wants you to do. You see? Man, that goes right back to the mercy of God again. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure <clears throat> in heart, for they shall see God. You see, how, why is it such a blessing to see God, man? Because you'll be like Him. Because you'll never be the same. You'll be converted. And you see, here's the thing. Once saved, always savers. We've got to see Him again and again and again, over and over and over until we leave these bodies or He comes back for us. Whichever happens first in our life. Peter said this in his second epistle. <clears throat> he said this. Let me just go there. Second Peter chapter 1. You got to see this, man. Second Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge, the knowing, the revelation of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things that pertain to life and godliness through, through the knowledge of Him as His divine nature has given to us, I'm sorry, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. <clears throat> now, right here. But also, for this very reason. What reason? The reason. But also for this very reason, what? To escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Being a partaker of the divine nature. Part of the definition of grace in the Greek, the grace of God that brings salvation, part of that definition is this. Deliverance from unclean passion and desires. Liberation. Freedom. Being set free out of the prison house of unclean passions and desires, okay? But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things, all those things we just said, are yours and abound, they continue, they get bigger and bigger, more and more, if these things are yours and abound, <clears throat> you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For he who lacks these things, what things? The continual process that we, you know, like on the back of your shampoo poo bottle, uh, wash, rinse, repeat. You got to, I know you don't keep washing your hair in the shower every time. The point is, that is how you, you have to maintain your salvation. You have to constantly be growing in faith and knowledge and virtue and love and kindness and goodness and self-control and perseverance. You have got to, because otherwise it says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted. Short-sighted, man. He can't see really far ahead of him. He can't really see what's coming. He can't really see what's going on around him. 
He's, he's, he's just able to see what's right in front of him. In other words, he's not able to live by faith no more. He's not able to see what's coming because the Spirit of God will show you things to come. But if you're not adding to your faith, if you're not walking by faith, you're blind, basically. You're only good enough to see what's right in front of you. You're only able to see carnally. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten, forgotten, forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Hmm. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. What? Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure? Your call and election? Right? You've heard that predestined? The elect? Hold on. Hold on a second. Let's deal with this while we're here. There's people out there who will say that God hand-selected everybody who would be born again and saved. God, this whole, let's say this whole room's filled. God's standing up here. He walks through. Hmm, uh, I'll pick you. I'll pick you. I don't like your mustache. I'll pick you. I'll pick you. I'll pick you. To hell with the rest of you. It's essentially with some theologian's doctrine of predestination and election is. Out of here. Out of here. Out of here. God wants all men to be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Is it not written? Right? So what does it mean to be elected or predestined? It's very simple, man. It's just that God already knew who would. God knows all things and sees all things. He knew from the foundation of the world who would accept His Son, Jesus Christ. He knew who, he, who, he knew who would. So Peter's telling us right here, your call, your election is in your hands. You need not worry about did God hands picked me or hand select me to be saved? What a silly question. Peter said right here, be even more diligent to make your call an election sure by doing these things, and you won't fall away, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our God and Father and His Lord, Jesus Christ. So, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And when we see God, we'll be like Him. And when we see God, we'll have an abundance of grace, an abundance of ability to do God's will, that we can be saved. Not our own abilities, man, not our own strength, because we're supposed to be dead with Christ. How can a dead man do anything? How can a dead man earn his way? He's, gotta be, he's dead, man. <clears throat> a dead man can't earn his way to heaven, but we're supposed to be dead with Christ. And the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, quickening your mortal body. The life of Jesus Christ is being manifested in your mortal flesh. And it's Jesus Christ working in you both to... Imagine a dead body, man. I mean, this might seem kind of morbid or strange to you, but a dead body. This is what it should look like. Jesus, I... I want to die to myself. I want to take up my cross and follow you. I submit. I repent. God, I want your will and your way. God says, okay, boom. He kills you. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. Baptism is supposed to represent that. God, kill me. Okay, boom. You're dead. Your dead body's lying on the ground. Now what? Jesus Christ is supposed to possess your body. He's supposed to quicken your body. And it's supposed to be Jesus Christ living in you, flowing through you, consuming you, leading you, guiding you, thinking for you. No, that would be great if that's quite literally how it turned out to be. But it's a constant battle. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary one to the other. You see, there's always going to be a battle. The old man going to try to come up from the dead like a filthy zombie and you got to kick him back down you got to kill him afresh new every day sometimes every five minutes it seems like on some days blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God 
When they see God, the reason they're blessed is because they'll be able to do what God says. They'll be able to live for God. They'll have the life of Jesus Christ flowing through their veins. The life will not be their own. They'll be able to say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, says the apostle, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. The faith, the faith of the Son of God. That's the faith that overcomes His faith. I just want to touch on that before we move on to the number 12 thing. His faith. His faith that was delivered to us. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you don't mind, to Acts chapter 3. I'm going to prove. Even, even Peter says it by the Spirit of God. His faith. Acts chapter 3. This is after... Um, this is after Peter and John are going to the temple at 3 in the afternoon to the temple to pray and they come up to the beautiful gate of the temple the temple at the or I'm sorry the gate of the temple called beautiful and there's a man who is handicapped from his mother's from is, is he was born handicapped he was born unable to walk laying there at the entrance of the gate every day daily asking for money asking for help asking for for food begging alms Peter and John were going to the temple. And Peter said to him, Look at us. It says The word says the man looked up expecting to receive something from them. And he said, Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he grabbed him by the hand and pulled this lame man up who'd been handicapped from the day of his birth. And he pulled him up. The man leaped up and danced and shouted and praised God. And they walked into the temple praising God. And everybody knew that that was the man who was just outside handicapped his whole life. Everybody knew it. And Peter said, uh, why do you look at us as though by our own power or our own righteousness or our own godliness that this man is made well? And he said this, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Verse 14, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, Barabbas, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised up from the dead of which we are witnesses. Let me just stop right there for a second and say this, man. Those men were in hiding after Jesus was crucified. Look, this really happened, man. Jesus of Nazareth, a man who lived in Nazareth over 2,000 years ago, was really actually crucified. And his actual, literal disciples forsook him and went into hiding for three days. It really happened, man. But something else happened. Look at what happened. Something must have really happened. For those guys to turn into demonically oppressed cowards and to someone who's willing to risk their life to proclaim and declare and teach and preach Jesus Christ. That man must have really raised from the dead and rocked their world. What do you say? I mean, come on, man. Peter said, of whom we are witnesses. Of whom we are witnesses. We saw him, we touched him, we felt him. We stuck our fingers in the wounds of his hands. You crucified him. You denied him. But God raised him up and we saw him. 
verse 16. And His name, Jesus, but not just His name. Although there's an eternal weight of glory attached to that name. They mean through His name, through His character, through His nature, through who He is. His eternal power in Godhead, His majesty, through His name, through faith in His name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, here it is. Yes, the faith which comes through Him has given Him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Do you see? Let's, we can revisit God's mercy again. God gives us the faith of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus lived by faith as a man. It is His faith that overcomes. It is His faith that got Him to the cross and endured it all for us. It says in Hebrews, for He endured all these sufferings. By, it was the, the grace of God enabled Him to suffer that way, it says. We've been delivered the faith for those of us who are in Christ and have been converted. Born again. Really. And have made Jesus Christ Lord. Have received His faith. His grace. What does John say? And what is that victory that overcomes the world? Even our faith in Him. He gives us His faith to have faith in Him. That's mercy, man. He gives us His money to spend on what He says to spend it on so that we can spend eternity with Him. That's why God has to judge the wicked and lazy servant at the end of the age who didn't do anything with His Master's money. Didn't do anything with his one shekel, his one mina, his one talent. You see, at the beginning of John, it says, through Je the, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And of his fullness, we have all received, and grace for grace. And the natural, um, in order to like open a business or gamble, I know it's a bad example, but... In order to gamble, you've got to have some money, right? I mean, unless... Anyways, you've got to have money in the natural to make money. You've got to have some money to invest, right? Jesus Christ gave us finance to do the will of God with. He took his money, grace for grace. I'll give you some grace that you can get some more grace, that you can get some more grace, and you can buy your way into my everlasting kingdom with my money, with my ability, with my life force. Mercy. Mercy. The number 12 thing that Jesus Christ came to do, Matthew 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I've only got two minutes left on that clock back there. <laughs> and I, I need a little more time than that to explain this one. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus came to make it possible for man to be reconciled back unto God, to no longer be at enmity with God, but at peace with Him, then we can be a son of God. Once that occurs, we can become a son of God. We will then, by the effectual working of Jesus Christ in us, begin to help others make peace with God. You see, um, remember Paul says we're ambassadors for Christ? Remember Paul said we've all been given the ministry of reconciliation, right? An ambassador will seek to make peace with another country, another government, to be diplomatic. Jesus Christ is our great ambassador between the Father and us. But guess what? Jesus isn't talking about just any kind of peace here. 
He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let's look at this. There's all kinds of people in the world talking about peace, love, unity, right? Posters from generations past. Uh, make love, not war. Make peace, not war, right? Holding up their banners, stoned out of their minds. The Buddhists, they want peace. They, they you know, in the natural, they're a peaceful kind of people, I suppose. Governments of the world say they want peace. Israel and Palestine trying to come to a peace agreement. The United States trying to be the great big peacemaker in the world. All kinds of people, all kinds of religions, all kinds of government bodies and civil organizations are trying to make peace. But guess what? We know that not all of them are sons of God. So what's Jesus talking about? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Remember Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace, but a sword. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to divide. I came to make a man's enemies those of his own household. I came to set a father against a son, a daughter against her mother, a mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and so on and so forth. That doesn't sound very peaceful, you might say. Okay. Look, there's all kinds of professing Christians, okay? Right now, the Pope and Kenneth Copeland and other people of like mind, are all climbing in bed with a man named Tony Palmer. Oh, let's have peace in the body of Christ. Let's all come into the unity of the body of Christ. Well, that sounds great on the surface. Yeah, I mean, God wants that, right? God wants peace in his body. God wants peace in his church. God wants unity, oneness, one accord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. As Jesus prayed till till. They all become one in us till we all come to the unity of the faith, to a perfect man, to the fullness of the stature of the fullness of Christ. A, a pure language, as God said in the book of Zephaniah, he will restore to the peoples of his covenant a pure language. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. All these other, listen, everything I just said about the false prophets and their unification of the, the false faith, the religions of the world, the government bodies of the world, the civic orders of the world, striving for peace. It's not the peace of God. They're not trying to make peace with God. That's the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about. And when he said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, he meant, I did not come to bring peace. I did not come to make a peace treaty with darkness, with, with carnal, fallen man. I did not come to make a peace treaty with the devil. I came to divide. Lies from the truth, the light from the darkness, the good from the bad, the evil from the righteous, death from life. And so Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In other words, blessed are those who seek to remain at peace with God, who seek to make peace with God, who seek to bring man into peace with God, who are ambassadors for the kingdom of God. You know, someone will say, I want peace. But there's terms. There's got to be terms we can come into agreement to. Right? Israel and Palestine, they want peace. But... They both have their own idea of how it should be, the terms that it must be come to. Look, Israel don't want to give up any of its land, and it shouldn't. That's a given. But Palestine wants what is belonging to Israel. Israel don't want to give it up. Palestine wants it. Israel has to say, sorry, no, no peace. We can't have peace because... You want something that you can't have. 
You want something that's not yours. You want something you've got no right to. And so Israel has to say, sorry, no deal. Oh, we want, we want there to be peace with us, but we can't have that. No, no. You see, God is, he's got to do the same thing with us. I want peace with you. But unless you're willing to go to the cross with my son and die with him, and let me resurrect you with him, with a new heart, a new, uh, a new, new desires, new passions, new purpose, his purpose, his heart, his mind, and then walk in that reality. Unless that is what you're willing to do, we can't have peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, and it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's in Romans 8. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who make peace with God, sustain peace with God, and then are used by God to bring others into peaceful relations with God. Blessed are not those who seek to make peace with the world, who seek to come into an agreement or a covenant or a unison with the world, who seek to make peace according to man's ways and man's ethics, these are not blessed, and these are not sons of God. Paul says in Romans 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And that's what Jesus came to do, is make us a son of God by making it possible to have peace with God, to sustain peace with God, and help others come into peace with God. Ambassadors for Christ. Ministers of reconciliation. Ephesians 5.1, it says, Therefore, as dear children, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love. Walk in love, not just any love, the love of God. You gotta, in order for you to walk in love and to love others as God requires, you have got to find a way in Christ, through faith, to love God first, above all else. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus' commandments are life. They'll keep us. They'll protect us. They'll guide us. And it's his righteousness. So, sons of God will do what God says. And they'll walk in the love of God. They'll love God. And because they love God, they, have, they now become a conduit for the love of God to flow through, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, the nature of God, the character of God to flow through and enable you to love others, to enable the husbands to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. It will enable the wife to love her husband and respect her husband and submit to her husband as I, as a man, as the man is to submit and love Jesus Christ. It will enable the parents to love their children as they ought to love, as the Father loves us. It will enable the child to love his parents as we are supposed to love God the Father. It will enable us to love our brothers and sisters as Jesus has loved his brothers and sisters. Because he said, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? But they that do the will of God. And in another gospel, we say, they who hear the word of God and do it. So, the number 10 thing that Jesus Christ came to do, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He came to give mercy, and that's a very broad subject. He came to give mercy, to show the Father's mercy. The number 11 thing, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He came to unfold, reveal, manifest, show us, declare God, who He is, to reveal God to those who want Him. And the 12th thing, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus came to make it possible for us to be at peace with God and become a son of God and enable others to make peace with God. Man. You guys know we can't do nothing of ourself. We don't possess any ability or any virtue to do what God is requiring of us and what God wants to do. 
Our only hope is Jesus Christ. Everything else is vanity. Everything else is vanity. Oh, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would seal up this word in the hearts of the hearers and the speaker. That you would let these words take root in our souls. And that it would bring transformation and renewal. God, that you would do a miracle in all those who have heard. And your will be done in us and through us, Jesus. And that you would reveal yourself to us more and more so we can be like you more and more, so that we can do your will more and more, Jesus. Holy Jesus. Holy Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. Amen.